We are Pro Cannabis Media. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Weed Talk News. I'm Jimmy Young. This is a weekly news report about the cannabis industry, including commentary. And I'm Kurt Dalton, and today is 710 International Dab Day. Not to be confused with 420, this day is all about concentrates and dabbing, so let's have a celebration. All right, after the show, for sure, Kurt. In the meantime, the biggest story, once again, and I'm going to give you credit here, you said high times will never get to an IPO, and now the SEC has basically said, Kurt, you're right. (laughs) <laughs> this is more like Charlie Brown and Lucy. There was never going to be a high times IPO. There never will be. That is why they could give out so much stock. That's why Stormy Simon could get a couple million dollars. The new president gets a couple million in stock. Oh, we got to do a couple deals. Let's give out another 10 million in stock. There was never going to be any stock to, to play with. They could give it out infinity wise. So it's going to be interesting because they have to file their, their corporate report to continue And they don't want to do that because it's horrendously bad with debt and with losing money. Now they're stuck. The SEC is on to this fake ending. I don't know if you guys are familiar. They basically said, we're about to close the doors. They're literally an electronic store in New Times Square or a carpet store in Times Square. We're about to close. Get your money in. And they've done this repeatedly. Rinse and repeat. Well, the SEC is on to this. And it's going to be real interesting coming up what they decide to do. And for the rest of the cannabis business news story and the High Times story, here's the Green Market Report's Deborah Bortrak. Deb? Thanks, Jimmy. Thanks, Kurt. Well, this week, Kushko Holdings reported their earnings, and they came in 46% lower than what they had been. Kushko has made a big shift. They are focusing on larger, more financially stable customers and tightening the credit on the smaller ones and the ones that were less secure. Revenue came in at $22 million, and this was lower than what analysts had expected, and it was even lower than what Kushko had said would come in. We also learned this week that High Times was told by the SEC to stop selling shares. High Times has not filed their annual report, and this is something that they need to do in order to keep selling shares. So High Times has filed for a delay in posting those numbers due to COVID. But the SEC said, well, it doesn't matter. You still have to stop selling those shares until you post that annual report. Now, it's interesting that the accountants can't make it in to do the financial audit, but the acquisition lawyers can. And then finally, Fire and Flower announced that they are opening two dispensaries right next door to Circle K. Now, this isn't a huge surprise because one of their biggest investors is Alimentation Couchard, which owns Circle K. But who knows, one day we could see Circle K selling cannabis. And that's it for this week. I'm Deborah Borchart with the Green Market Report for Weed Talk News. Thanks, Deb. And in the next chapter of Cannabis Businesses Acting Poorly, the story of MedMen. And it looks like they've got a ton of lawsuits, Kurt, and they're trying to restructure their company with a $32 million debt restructuring deal. But it's another chapter of the people in the cannabis business not really acting like business people. It's another example of shady cannabinoids getting what's coming to them. You're seeing the downfall of MedMen. I think Adams, they're going after Adams' house next to Leo. I think Andrew now has to sell his house. Uh, You get, you know, the chickens are coming home to roost when the cash dries up in the cannabis industry. And MedMen is a prime example. And we even had the uh, Tommy Chong talking about the new Cheech and Chong dispensaries, looking at three or four of the MedMen locations. So MedMen may be a memory quicker than you think, Jimmy. Yeah, circling the wagons. All right, now let's move on to Mr. Teflon. Uh, our friend Bruce, Bruce Linton, the likable former CEO of Canopy Growth, has raised $150 million for Collective Growth Corporation. It's a NASDAQ-traded group that's going to acquire hemp companies. So, Kurt, my question to you is, as you look at the future, as you look into your crystal cannabis ball, okay, which industry has a bigger upside? Is it the hemp industry with all their multiple uses or is it the THC based cousin of cannabis? So it really depends on your timeline because THC can get out there faster, no pun intended, and be enjoyed by people, whether it's medical or recreational. So if you're looking for a quicker investment, a two to five, two to three year plan, it's your THC. 
Now the uses for industrial hemp are gonna be change the world type stuff, but we're gonna be five years away from that. Um, and you're still gonna get, if you're a CBD person, you're gonna get that in your cannabis plant that has THC. So if your time frame is two years or less, you gotta go with the THC. If you have a five to 10 year window, then certainly industrial hemp could change the entire uh, you know, uh, building structure as well as um, material structure on the planet. Absolutely, and eventually the uh, cannabis actual plant and or hemp will be traded globally as a commodity because you do grow this particular item, right? Oh, I mean, we've talked about that's gonna be traded in Chicago. It's gonna be a commodity. There's gonna be a medical grade, um, a recreational grade. There'll be an industrial hemp grade. Um, yep, there'll be contracts. You can be able to hedge. Once everybody starts to grow, when the US changes that federal law, and 136 countries are allowed by the UN to go about their business without ramification from the US, it's gonna be great. You're gonna have low cost areas with electricity and labor, growing it with warm weather. Uh, it's really, again, we talked about margin compression just coming for years to come, and that's why. Indeed, and California remains the unofficial weed capital of the United States. After all, they've had medicinal going, I believe, since 1995. And we, we just lost all our Colorado fans, but keep going. Oh, we love Colorado too, but you know, California's bigger, okay, let's face it. And 80% of the illicit market in cannabis in the United States is grown in that Emerald Triangle, that group of three counties at the, in the northern part of California. Well, in LA and in Southern California, the Cannabis Control Commission of California is now going after that illegal market. And over the past few weeks, they've actually put out a couple of tax liens on illegal operators. And the California State Highway Patrol is the one that actually confiscated a million dollars worth of product and about $100,000 in cash. Truly a mere pittance. But tax liens, of course, can put you in jail. Is that where law enforcement should be looking for their efforts, basically making sure that the illegal market is, well, bruised, I guess? Well, Jimmy, first of all, it's not the size of the market, it's the quality of the bud. So <laughs> at least that's what my wife tells me. Yeah, that's so what in I hear general, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, California has to clean up their black market and they're looking for ways to do it. And certainly this is one way to kind of get that Al Capone tax evasion charge on cannabis of black market growers. So not surprising. Should it be going to that? That's a whole different show. But is it surprising that that's what they're doing and, and, and finding a way through liens and through these things to shut down uh, black market? Not really. They're trying everything. So we'll see if it works. And in the meantime, north of the border in O Canada, they've got a surplus. And Solomon Israel from MJ Biz Daily's International Division has our O Canada Cannabis Report. I'm Solomon Israel from Marijuana Business Daily International, and this is the Weed Talk News Canadian Cannabis Report. Canada's cannabis producers have been stockpiling record amounts of unsold marijuana. As of April, growers and processors were sitting on more than 620,000 kilograms of unpackaged flour, plus 85,000 kilograms of packaged inventory. Major producers like Canopy and Aurora have been cutting excess capacity in recent months. Ontario is planning to end an emergency order that let private sector cannabis stores offer curbside pickup and home delivery during the COVID-19 pandemic. Those stores have now reopened to in-store shopping, but some say the sudden loss of delivery will make it harder to compete with the illegal market. And on Canada's East Coast, New Brunswick government-owned retailer Cannabis NB has posted its second ever positive quarter. The retailer's 20 stores sold $16.3 million Canadian dollars worth of cannabis in the quarter for a $1.4 million profit. Despite that, New Brunswick's government says it's moving ahead with a plan to sell the retailer off to the private sector. You can read those stories and more at mjbizdaily.com. That's it for this week's Weed Talk News Canadian Cannabis Report. I'm Solomon Israel from Marijuana Business Daily. Thanks, Solomon. And Kurt, there's a new report out, out of Colorado that studies the increase or decrease of crime in neighboring states around Colorado and Washington, two you know, legal states that have had it for about 10 years. What do you think 
is the result of this study. Did crime actually go up or did it go down in neighboring states? Well, since we run, I run cannabis.net and we report on this, uh, I know it goes down. There's been multiple studies. The FBI has actually released a memo that around dispensaries, crimes uh, go down. So it, it's going to go down. But go, what's the new study say the rates look like? Pretty much. We Well, I don't know if it actually reports on the rates, but the conclusion is they observed a substantial reduction in certain types of crime, namely larceny and simple assault in border counties in the Colorado region. Overall, the results from the Colorado region provide some evidence suggesting the crime reducing effect of legalization in neighboring states. The authors then add uh, this will actually counter that argument that if you legalize cannabis, it will add to the crime rate. Instead, it actually decreases it. Surprised? No, that's really a reefer madness thing. When you really think through, if you're going to have legal cannabis around that's doing a verification of age and is high by quality, you're going to decrease the black market in that area. A, the effects of cannabis are generally to mellow and not become violent like alcohol. So just putting those two factors together, if you think about it, it would decrease crime because People are kind of stoned and they're able to get their weed without going to the black market. So not a big problem. And you're raising tax dollars. You know, if you want to clean up a shelter or create a school and do this stuff. So you almost want to support legal, even though it may be more expensive because you know it's going to your community. Now, one of the challenges in legal states is what to do with the drivers who are operating under the influence of cannabis. And more importantly, how to actually measure the amount of cannabis that a person might have in their system. And... Sure enough, Kurt, uh, we, you and I have debated this a little bit. Um, this is a challenge. I know you feel that way, right? Yep. We're going to start the very new era of just like they were doing Bartholizers for alcohol. How much is a six pack for a person who's 180 pounds? How tall are you? Have you are you a regular drinker? So maybe a six pack does X to one person and completely you know, obliterates another person. Uh, same thing we're going to go through with cannabis. I mean, uh, habitual users obviously have a higher tolerance so they can smoke a joint and then drive later on. First timers, no, won't be able to move from, you know, off their couch for six hours. Okay. So you're going to have to be able to have something that's going to measure um, the, like that THC effect, maybe in the fat cells or the blood, as opposed to your breath or how they're going to test it. So as you might expect, the advertising council has now put out a advertisement or a public service announcement talking about the dangers of driving high. Let's check it out. Multiple studies have shown that marijuana can slow both driver reaction and response time, which can be really dangerous. Marijuana use also impacts divided attention. The brain's ability to pay attention to multiple things at once. Ah! He's here. He's here. He's here. He's here. Hurry! Hurry! He's here. Ah! Yes! Yes! Wait! 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 What? I can't drive. Why? I'm high. Oh. All right, Kurt, well, now you've seen it. I happen to think it reeks of reefer madness. So they're trying to use scare tactics. And what do you think? Do you agree or not? Well, I, I tell you one thing. If, if there is a guy with an ax who's taking swings at me and chasing me, I am going to drive high. I'm going on record. I'm going. I'm hitting the gas pedal. I'm not switching with my buddy at that point. Uh, but I think it's more of ingest. Again, I think it's so over the top with the ax and the guy with a potato sack on his head. And it's actually pretty funny at the end when the guy's trying to save his life and goes, oh, I can't drive. I'm high. So I think they took kind of a humorous approach just to the point of don't drive high as opposed to this big anti-marijuana commercial. There you go. And of course, they are targeting the male that is 18 to 35 years old, and people can fill in their own joke on that target of that demographic, uh, just about the intelligence level of the, when I was 18 to 35, I know what my intelligence level was. Anyway, um, what bothers me is the Ad Council spends hundreds of thousands of dollars on producing something like this message. 
and acreage holdings that had a powerful PSA about the impact of cannabis and how it has changed people's lives, they were not allowed to air it on the CBS uh, Super Bowl this past year. Um, your feelings about that? Yeah, that's a really powerful ad, actually. We, let's take a look at it now and compare the two. Austin would have dozens to hundreds of seizures every single day. None of the prescriptions would work. One pill almost killed our son. I've had three back surgeries, and I was on opioids for 15 years. It was a very dark, very depressive time in my life. After my injury, I felt like I couldn't live with the pain, but I couldn't live with this treatment long term. It was unbearable. I don't have to live like that anymore. Medical cannabis saved Austin's life. Cannabis has given me my life back. There are families in other states having to watch their children die. I want to see my brothers and sisters who sacrificed so much for this country have access to the safest treatment possible. This really is an injustice. It's not just unfair, it's cruel. You know, that commercial, that public service announcement that Acreage Holdings just showed again, or we, we aired here, uh, is very powerful. It's an emotional. And how many times, Kurt, have you heard these kinds of stories about people who say cannabis has saved my life, cannabis has changed my life or my child's life? All you have to do is go on Google and YouTube the videos of, of parents, uh, not only with kids, but themselves, whether it's opioids, PTSD, veterans. Look up veterans videos and what cannabis has done to them. Some of the, the, the really full length uh, features even done like a Netflix. It's it's just phenomenal. And speaking of more news in the phenomenal category, where else? But let's go to Washington, D.C., to our friend Phil Adams from the Vote Pro podcast and our D.C. report. Phil? Hi, Phil Adams from Vote Pro podcast, here with the Weed Talk News D.C. report. The National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws says Joe Biden's newly released cannabis policy is out of step with public opinion and would do little to bring about the substantive changes voters are demanding. Said Normal Executive Director Eric Altieri, quote, it is impractical at best and disingenuous at worst for the Biden campaign to move ahead with these policy pro proposals, end quote. Altieri said Biden's proposals for the decriminalization and rescheduling of cannabis under the Controlled Substances Act would not change its classification as contraband and would continue an overall enforcement policy that has clearly failed. Legislation unveiled by the House this week to fund federal agencies for the next year include a number of pro-cannabis riders, including provisions to protect state medical marijuana laws from federal interference, relax banking restrictions, expand research, oversee the burgeoning hemp and CBD industries, and allow recreational cannabis sales in the District of Columbia. Some of these provisions have passed in the House before, either as standalone legislation or inserted into coronavirus relief bills, but all have been killed in the Senate. U.S. cannabis sales are on a pace to top $15 billion in 2020, according to the latest fact book published by Marijuana Business Daily. That figure would represent a 40% increase over last year. That's the Weed Talk News DC report from the nation's capital. I'm Phil Adams from Vote Pro Podcast. Okay, thank you, Phil Adams. And you do want to check out that MJ Biz Daily's fact book that is now available online. And one of the interesting factoids in the cannabis news world is that the state of Illinois, a legal state now, has just set a single month sales record in June of $47 million in one month. And Kurt, Illinois has not been open, uh, has been open far less than our native state here in Massachusetts. So Obviously, the people in Illinois are enjoying the legalization of the cannabis plant. Governor Pritzker, as opposed to um, the governor here in Massachusetts, has been very, uh, you know, rushing cannabis forward and actually getting it in the hands of the people. Um, and as their, their debt is about to go become a junk bond status third world country. So they need that tax revenue almost as much as New Jersey. So we'll see what it goes. That's what it's all about. And of course, the governor you couldn't remember is that Charlie Baker guy. I just wanted to throw out there. Uh, 
I knew that. I knew that. And finally tonight, the city of New York and the administration of their mayor, Bill de Blasio, um, is actually hoping that citizens of New York will call 911 when they see people partaking in the smoking of marijuana in pro public. Now, Kurt. Oh, that, is that true? That is true. That is a true story. It's right on the, right on the page of uh, New York City, the, the, the administration of New York. If you see it, you should call 911. Isn't that kind of a waste of the law enforcement's time? And is it really an emergency? That, that doesn't seem to really qualify. And you know with COVID that all the 911 operators are probably working at home on a headset. They're probably getting an email or some sort of Slack saying what the new rules are. And could you imagine when they first that popped up going, okay, yeah, killing, yep, if you throw it away. Wait, what? Wait, if they're smoking weed, they're going to call us? Like, no way. It's going to turn into a Cheech and Chong skit. Can you imagine those, those um, calls are public record? You could have access to them. Can you imagine the calls and the radio shows are going to have a field day when those first hundred calls come in and they edit them up? It's going to be great. We should get on that. We should we should get on that. And that is the whole new world of weed these days. You never know what's going to make the news and become a news story. Well, that'll do it for another week of Weed Talk News. I'm Jimmy Young. And I'm Kurt Dalton. Remember, it's a whole new world of weed out there. Use it responsibly. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We Talk Now, We Talk News, and In the Weeds are all available on most major podcast distributors like iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, and our friends at clnsmedia.com and our flagship, cannabis.net. So subscribe, share, and like our videos on all the social media networks out there, including LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, The Weed Tube, and YouTube. Weed Talk and In the Weeds are two productions of Pro Cannabis Media supported by Revolutionary Clinics, one of the top medical cannabis dispensaries in the Massachusetts area. Now with three locations in Greater Boston, two in Cambridge and one on Broadway in Somerville. Rev Clinics has a patient first mission. They will customize your needs as a medical patient with the proper titration and combination of strains, flavors, and products. Rev Clinics, where the patient comes first. We are Pro Cannabis Media.